Welcome back to our channel, the Warriors. We are still growing. If you haven't had that person that's always reaching out to you when things go wrong, smash that subscribe button. Go and have them smash it right now. First and foremost, let me give a shout out to the newest patrons. G, Juliet Alpha Whiskey, Chris, I'm a cabron, new boot, Cassandra, J.I., Soulstar LA, Brenda, Marshall, Jamie, Albert 12, Edwin, Charles, The Soulist, David, Lead With Love, Michael, Mika Boy, Hobie Cat, Nathan, Joe Kez, El Skid, Grant, Sergio, Benny, Erasmo, Main Jail Yard, and Trevor. As you can see, that list is getting bigger. If you have not already signed up for that Patreon, make sure you hit that link in the description below. You are definitely missing out. This episode right here, man, as I started off by saying, if you haven't had the people that reach out to you when things are not going uh, the best of ways, you know, send their condolences, their regards. That is because yesterday, my dog died. My dog died, we had to put him down. My dog Munchkin, uh, 14 years old, man, loyal, protector. <sighs> he was a multi-poo, but nevertheless, he was a good protector, right? Um... Death, grief, mourning, loss, loyalty. All of that is extremely hard on me. Extremely hard on me. But I have come a long way. I have come a long way from, from leaps and bounds from what it used to look like and what it was like. I grew up in a Mexican household. right? My dad was old school Mexican. Right, always working on the car outside, always mowing the grass. And uh, not to put a stereotype on it, but that's what he would be doing. <laughs> he's a straw hat, right? He's only 20 years older than me. So if I'm 38, whatever he 20 years is ahead, that's, that's how old he is. We didn't really communicate growing up as a family. There wasn't much communication. Right, and I'm not knocking them. I'm just letting you know my upbringing. Right, there was no "How are you feeling? What are your feelings like?" No. Um. Back to my recollection when we had pets. <laughs> oh man, here we go. <laughs> we used to have a dog, girl. That's like my childhood dog. She would have litters of, of puppies, right? Well, once in a while, they would... The, not all of them would make it. Not all of them would survive birth. So my dad would, like, get the, the little fetuses of the of the, the little puppies. And I remember we'd put them in cereal boxes, and then we'd go out to the dump and bury them. Right? I was like, okay, here's my dad just picking up. I'm, I'm watching this. When girl died... Here goes my dad with a shovel in the backyard, digs a big giant hole, just throws girl in a freaking, uh, in a sheet, and then just boom, there you go, put some dirt over, and that's a wrap, let's call it a day. But, I'm just watching this, right, as a kid, I'm observing this, and it's like, I never got introduced to grief. I never learned what it was until I was in Iraq, in Balad, on that street next to the Tigris River, and I looked over and I see my brother Edgar Doc Daklon dead lying in the road when I was 19 years old. My whole world came crashing down on me instantly. It, it was a nightmare. My life was shattered. You know, I'm not being exaggerating. I'm, my, my innocence left me. That's what I meant by that. I felt my innocence leave me. Poof. That, that, at that exact moment. A lot of things went through my mind. One was, um, I was always under the belief system that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. But here I see my brother that's dead in the middle of the road. I didn't know what grief was. We didn't have time to grieve or mourn the loss of our army brothers as we continued mission. 
We return to base. We congregated as a platoon, 30, 30 of us. And the following day, we went out on patrol. The following day, it did not skip a beat. Nothing changed. Nothing changed except with the exception of we had one last member in the platoon and we had to get a new medic, which we did. Uh, battalion sent us down a new medic, period. When I came back from Iraq, nobody told me about post-traumatic stress disorder. Nobody told me about alcoholism. Nothing, none of this. You have to understand where I'm coming from and why I'm telling you guys this. I self-medicated. Check this out. I was the king of self-medicating. I'm talking about a fifth of vodka a night. Added in the 12-pack of Coronas every single night for, for sure for the whole year of 2005. For sure. One whole year, drunk 24-7, intoxicated, disaster, um, a, a, a mess, right? a, a hurt individual, a broken individual. One thing you guys never knew about me is that I value dogs more than I value humans. Oh, Hector, you can't say that. Well, I just did. Dogs are the most loyal, man's best friend. Right? Unless you be trying to take their food and they snap at you, they really ain't going to turn on you. Right? Or at least in my experience. Loyal to the end. I'll even go further, man. I, I, I want to tell you guys the truth. In Iraq, <clears throat> some of my friends were shooting dogs, stray dogs, right? There's stray dogs everywhere <clears throat> in Iraq. And those dogs bark. When you go on a raid, you're, 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 you're raiding houses in the middle of the night. You're kicking in a door. Those stray dogs will bark and give up your position. In turn, will jeopardize your safety. Right, the, the people wake up, the, the insurgents wake up in the middle of the night. Who is there? Um, oh, Jesus Christ, it's the United States Army trying to... And then they're, they're ready. I, I never could shoot a dog. Right? I never did, I never could. Humans, bad guys, was not a problem. Right, And I say it's not a problem because shooting a dog to me was a problem. Shooting a human to me in war was not a problem. And we're talking about problems. So I have a four-year-old daughter now. I'm a father for the first time around, right? This is me, a father. I have 12 years of sobriety. I have a lot of life experiences, all of which I learned the hard way. I come on here and I share messages daily, daily. If you look back at all my videos, every single video I do, I'm leaving you with something. I'm leaving you with something that I learned the hard way that can hopefully make your path easier. Every time something happens, I always think, how can I, how can I, how can I convey this message to my daughter? How can I make her understand what is happening? In a manner which probably would have helped me either growing up and or for the future of sake of my, my daughter's knowledge. That dog, man, my poor dog Munchkin, man, my, my boy, my son. He was uh, laying on the ground not doing much yesterday. You could tell. He, he, there had been a lot already. This had been coming, right? Inevitable. He had been slow. My boy had been slowing down. Ooh, man. The other day he fell down the stairs. Poor kid. I heard him miss a step and he just rolled. Do, 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 do. I look at him. He looked at me like, damn, dad. Oof, right? <laughs> we, <clears throat> my wife and I explained to our daughter, hey, you know, Munchkin's not doing so good. Munchkin is about to go to the hospital. Munchkin is not going to make it back. And my daughter's, f she'll be five in about a week or two. 
In two weeks, in two weeks, my daughter will be five. She is smart. Trust me. A every parent will say their kid is smart, right? You look at their kid, they're over there eating their boogers. <laughs> Not my daughter. Trust me. Right? Eating their boogers, putting gum in their hair. Look, daddy. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Freaking pencil sticking out of their eye. <laughs> right before I left Donovan, I kid you not, an inmate in Adseg got a number two pencil and jammed it in its eye. I had to go see it for myself, right? <laughs> I do have a picture. I did, did not miss the opportunity to take the cell phone out of my pocket and take a picture, of course. <laughs> I might even post it on my Patreon. That's what it's for, right? You guys can see things like that. So, my daughter, I could see her feelings. I could see her, the look on her face. I'm just observing her, right? I, I'm hurting. Oh, my goodness, I'm hurting. But I got to be strong, right? Because I told you I grew up in a machismo house, a Mexican, Latino, machismo, men don't cry. Um, oh, man, I was laying on the floor in the, in the formal living room with the dog, making sure my daughter didn't see me, of course, but all oh, tears were coming down my eyes. All oh, tears were coming down my eyes because, ah, oh, man, we were just, you know, my dog was just face to face, cheek to cheek, eyeballs to eyeballs, looking into each other's eyes, man. Oh, my son. And, um, We go to the pet hospital. As I'm driving, I'm hurting, man. I'm hurting. Trust me. You're never going to just see me put up a front on this channel for you guys. That would not be beneficial. Trust me. You have to see it all. The good, the bad, the ugly, the pain. I passed a liquor store on the way to the pet hospital. It was right there on the left. I seen it right there. Instantly. Instantly my mind tells me. Go over there. Go get a 40. Go get a mad dog. You know it's going to numb the pain. You know how to stop this. right? I don't even be knowing if they make mad dog 2020s anymore. I don't know. It's probably a thing of the past. But then it's. I, I checked myself like damn. Like damn dude you're an alcoholic. You're, you're an alcoholic. Like, that's the alcoholic mind. The addictive mind. And I told you guys, I was the king of self-medication. And in my, I told myself, when I saw that liquor store, I said, you can mess everything all up right now. You are the king of messing everything all up. You know exactly how to do it. You know exactly what to do. Go. Oh, no. Right, I have a sponsor through the program of AA. I sent him a text. I said, I'm on the way to put my dog down. I'm hurting, period, sent. Then I went on about my business. <clears throat> we, um, we go there, right? Whether or not I wanted my daughter to be inside that room, I didn't. I didn't want my daughter to be inside that room. My wife, my wife is struggling through her her own right. That's she, that was her son as well. That that's my wife's ordeal. I didn't want my daughter to see that. My daughter wouldn't leave my wife's side. My wife insisted on being there. I start getting angry. I start getting rage. Of course. Back to Iraq mentality, back to what I know, back to what I know. Check this out, guys, man, I, I, I'm 38 years old. I'm 12 years sober. I left the department seven, the California Department of Correction seven months ago. My mind still does what my mind wants to think, right? Hector, go get fucked up. Go get drunk. Go get high. Turn your pain into rage. Hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. Think about that. And I used to be the king of that. Oh, I caused so much chaos and destruction and heartbreak in my path. Oh, man. There's probably people to this day that will probably look at me still in disgust for the shit that I used to do in the past. Just disrespectful with it. 
violent with it. We come home. And I said, I, I told you guys, I always look for an opportunity to teach my daughter. And this is what I told her, and I told her like this for a reason. I said, baby, what feeling are you feeling right now? She said, sad, daddy. I said, just, to you, just so you know, that sadness is called grief. And what you're feeling right now is grief. Say grief. She's like, grief. I want her to know... I want her to know, right? Because as G.I. Joe used to say back in the day, knowing is half the battle. I don't know what her future holds, right? Every individual, every human is their own person. But I at least want her to have that foundation, that baseline. You know, when I was in, when I was in rehab, I, I went to rehab when I was a CO, 28 day inpatient treatment the warden at the time allowed me to do that my hat I, I i'm forever grateful for that opportunity they knew i was a co in there and i was in there man it's a rehab i was in there with parolees uh p- street gang members probably it, it, people who suffering from alcoholism addiction myself and during one of these little classes, these little classes, right? You got to take all these classes. It's the whole point. There was some dude. He's a parolee, white guy. And he straight up says, Hector, don't you feel bad that you swore to protect the law, that you became a cop, and you're over here breaking the law and drinking? <laughs> well, that like... Uh, <laughs> That shocked the counselor, the instructor, the teacher, whatever she was, the counselor, the doctor. And she almost like, you could see the shock the, the, on her face, right? And I, and I looked at her like, hold on, ma'am. Like, I got this. Like, relax. Right? Like, it's not that serious. I said, check this out, dude. Alcoholism doesn't pick and choose who gets it, man. I got it. My grandpa had it. I, it's hereditary. Um, and then that kind of calmed everything down and it put things in perspective to everybody. Everybody settled down, right? I didn't lose my cool. <laughs> she thought, I, I actually got amused out of it. I'm like, damn, Stu went for it, huh? <laughs> There's one last jab at the, at, the, at the copper, right? I'm like, hey, man, I'm an alcoholic. I don't know what to tell you, dude. Like, <laughs> doesn't skip a beat. Doesn't pick and choose, right? So when it comes to the prison system, being a CO, being a sergeant, being a lieutenant, being around inmates wearing blue, you know, at the academy, they, they, you guys want to know Greenside, you guys want to know what they be teaching us. Do they teach you to be cold hearted, calloused individuals? (laughs) They would tell us, Hey guys, be empathetic, not sympathetic, right? They would, they would tell us be firm, fair, and consistent. And then they would tell us, be empathetic, not sympathetic towards the image. Meaning, hey, you can understand what they're going through, but don't feel, so- don't feel sorry for them. <laughs> Looking back, that's kind of harsh, right? But it, 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 like I said, maybe everything's for design. It's, everything is by design, right? You can't be like, hey, buddy, come here. Let me give you a hug. Hey, don't trip because that's not how prison works. Anybody will tell you that's not how prison works, especially in California. Right. There is no kumbaya moments. I bring that up because I saw plenty of addiction. Plenty of addiction in prison. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of loss. From an empathetic standpoint, as I was taught. I remember at Sentinella State Prison, Charlie Yard, Level 4. Charlie, I was working the floor of the floor cop in Charlie 2 or Charlie 3. The sergeant either called me on the phone, called me on the phone, or told me, and told me to walk to the program, the sergeant's office. So I get up, I walk over there. He looks at me and he says, hey, man, the inmate in, there's an inmate in cell 148. 
ish, 148, like lower C section. I remember that. He just, he, they just notified us that his brother was just shot to death on the streets. Gang banging. Go let him know. Let him know he can use the phone whenever he wants. Right? It's one of those things where we're fair with it. Where we understand. <clears throat> Maybe not in all situations, but Sentinella like that, different people, some people get it, right? A lot of people get it, so we're not going to screw people over. Do people get screwed over? Yeah, but I was not talking about that. So I'm like, damn, oh man, wow. So I go back to the building, a hey, control, pop, 148. I walk to C-section. There's the phones right there. There's two phones. There's two phones on each section of the, of the, of the day room. The OG black dude, man. D number or E number type. And, and for those of you guys who don't know, in California, CDC, California Department of Corrections started giving out CDCR numbers starting with the letter A. And then as the years progressed, they went A numbers, B numbers, C numbers, D numbers, E. Right now, we're like in BG. We're in something crazy. But there's something to be said about those numbers. There's a different type of convict. OG black dude comes out. I was an old man. He wasn't an old man. He was fairly middle age, but I cut the way he carried himself with the OG. And I could tell, man, the way people carry themselves, I can tell comes up kind of like, what's up, right? Not disrespectful either. Just what's up? Well, how you be popping my door <laughs> today, man, you know, I, uh, Hey, I'm sorry, dude, but, uh, they just called right now and your brother passed away, man. I don't know if I was expecting this dude to break down bawling, crying, falling on the floor, making a scene. I think I was expecting that. This dude's facial expression didn't change. I said, hey man, you can use the phone whenever you want. Like, handle your business. I know you need to make some calls. He looked at me. He said, I'm good. Walked back to his cell. I was like, damn. Damn, this dude. A. Has been through a lot. B. Was surely covering up that pain, sorrow, if he had any. Putting on that <clears throat> hardcore front persona. Which is not necessarily a bad thing in that environment. But overall, that is not a good thing because I've done that. I've done that. Right. And uh, ultimately, what I found helpful is talking through it, getting the proper th treatment, therapy. I've seen so many inmates overdose. I've seen a lot of inmates overdose and die. I've seen a lot of drug addicted inmates on heroin then towards the end, fentanyl, die, and we bring them back five times, six times. Even These people died five or six different times. We brought them back, died, flatline, ain't no, hello, nobody there, dead. Shocker pads, uh, boom. I was going to say EKG, but that's not an EKG. That's, I uh, uh, forgot what that's called. Oh, well, you don't go like this, man. That's like probably like the movies. You put a patch here and you put a patch right here and then it shocks you. Stand back. <laughs> Right. Um, AED defibrillator. AED. That's what it was called. AED Siri, not ED. Oh my goodness! With that, I'm gonna wrap it up, man. I'm gonna wrap it up. I hope you guys were able to gain something from there. From this message like. <clears throat> we all go through it man. We all go through it. And if we don't properly. Oh mind you. Hey I stayed sober yesterday. 
Trust me, I stayed sober. I don't have that option of getting drunk, getting high. I have to, I have to fucking feel it, man. I have to go through the pain. But trust me, this is a lot better. Oh, the consequences. There ain't no consequences, right? Before, oh my goodness, this would have been a, <laughs> this would have been a one month bender, a one month bender tornado from hell. Then I have to, then I have to clean up that mess that I made. If anybody's still willing to talk to me. And then I still got to grieve the loss of my, my, my pet, my son, Munchkin. It's just no way, man. So the message for today is, hey, we're all hurting, right? We all will hurt at some point. It is not weak. It is not weak to ask for help. Keep pushing forward.